Um, welcome to the National Heritage Area's Best Practices Call. Um, my name is Sarah Lyle, and I am working out of Arabia Mountain National Heritage Area in Georgia, and I'm joined by Heather Wickens. She's got her camera off, but we, um, along with Katie Durkin, uh, coordinate this call every month. So thank you so much for joining. Um, just so you know, this session is being recorded. And if you could please um, mute your microphones um, and please utilize the chat to ask any questions and we'll hopefully have some opportunity for discussion at the end of our session today. So we are really excited um, about our topic today. Um, it is February and it is Black History Month. So we want to learn from other national heritage areas how they are amplifying Black stories and Black voices in particularly um, in the wake of all of the social justice movements of this summer. Um, I know at Arabia Mountain National Heritage Area, we're always telling these stories, but I, I think that we are certainly feeling a lot different about how much we, we share and how we share. Um, so I, I think that we're not alone in that. So we're really excited about our speakers today. We'll be hearing from um, Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area, Mississippi Hills, and Motor Cities. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jim from Freedom's Frontier to tell, um, to learn about a very exciting grant program that they started. Thank you, Sarah. It's good to be with you all. I want to acknowledge a couple of people who are with me here today. Uh, Johnny Slaughterback, who many of you know. Uh, Johnny is our um, uh, emerging technology coordinator, which means he also runs the um, PowerPoints for these kind of endeavors and will be bringing yeah, I just got in. his PowerPoint up for you in just a moment um, along the way. I also will have with us and introduce to you later someone many of you are just getting to know, our new associate director, Holly Zane. But I want to start off with my board chair, Grant Glenn. Grant's in his second year as chair of the trustees of Freedom's Frontier. We have a 28 member board that is um, serving from an area about the size of Indiana. So uh, it is a, a, a tremendous amount of time and commitment Grant has made to this, but in this last year, Grant in particular has very, been very committed to uh, our third theme, which is the enduring struggle for freedom. So I'd like to invite Grant to uh, talk and explain why this was so important for us to act on, on this, uh, this late spring. Go ahead, Grant. Grant, you're, you're muted. Unmute. There, there let go. me try again. I'm, I'm, I, I said that I was happy to be with, the, with you and be able to share a few thoughts. Uh, I know this is a great or, support organization for Freedom's Frontier and appreciate the time that you've provided us. Uh, this spring after the George Floyd incident, uh, I, I was learning things that I didn't know. And I had no idea what I didn't know. And as part of that process, I said to my wife, Donna, I, you know, I'm not sure what we can do. You know, I was kind of dumbfounded and, and for a moment. And then I said, well, gee, I'm chairman of Freedom's Frontier. Maybe I can do something. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that it was important that the organization do something significant. And uh, with that, we, we uh, appointed a committee, kind of a diverse committee. Our board is very diverse, but it has a lot of old white men on it, and uh, including myself. And what we started to learn was that many people uh, were just like Donna and I, we, we just were not aware of what we did not know. And we formed this committee and uh, the committee uh, made some recommendations 
that, uh, that we do th three basic things. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about what the board itself is doing uh, at the, a little bit later. But there were two basic grant programs that we wanted to support. Uh, the first is the Kansas City Race Project, which we helped uh, found with financially and, and with, with staff support. And that is an outstanding project that has been provided, I think, information to you before. But it gets to the beginnings uh, of, of students. Uh, and the only problem with the program is that it's not big enough. It doesn't serve enough, enough students in enough communities. So there's a huge opportunity to grow an outstanding program that would work in almost any city in America, unfortunately. And secondly, we wanted to work through our partners to reinforce that this enduring struggle for freedom, uh, many of our sites are historic sites. Uh, many of them are based in the Civil War or the Oregon Trail or Santa Fe Trail uh, in, in various points in history. And we have always challenged uh, our, our partners to look at history in today's lens and make yourself relevant. And we thought that supporting a series of grants to encourage our partners to engage in uh, stories and programs and dialogue on racial justice would be appropriate. And uh, we, we did an RFP and we found that Many of our partners were indeed interested and many of them were willing, several of them were willing to work together. And I think Holly will actually explain some of the programs in detail, but that's kind of the format. The, the committee made recommendations to the board, the board wholeheartedly endorsed. And, uh, and I said, I, I thought it was important for the board to do more than just put money at it. And we'll come back to that later. Uh, Holly? Jim, <laughs> Holly is uh, it, many of you know is the uh, uh, new uh, addition to our staff who came on just about the time that we were launching this. So Holly, um, you put together some slides with Johnny's assistance, I know, to provide a little bit more in-depth information about the partner discussion grants and the other programs that we've been running. So. Holly, if you'll take it away. Will do. Um, uh, please note also my email address. If you could go back to the earlier slide that if you want to not have to take a, a notes, uh, uh, but would want a copy of these PowerPoints, I'd be happy to send them to you along with a copy of the RFP and uh, a sample grant application. Um, but as uh, uh, Mr. Glidden pointed out, uh, Freedom's Frontier developed a unique series of uh, racial equity grants called partnership discussion grants. And our request for a proposal or RFP listed several themes that the grant would fund. We were really looking for ways that uh, communities could discuss or explore equity and social justice issues and, and better address, uh, address them. Uh, making a connection to uh, struggles for uh, freedom in the past and struggles for freedom uh, currently. We did award seven grants um, uh, ranging from $1,000 to $2,500 each. And the next slides are what the grantees have done or are planning to do with those funds. Um, just this month, uh, the University of Kansas, uh, University of Missouri at Kansas City, um, they partnered with Race Project KC and others and hosted a virtual presentation on racial equity issues um, with best-selling author uh, Ibram uh, uh, Kendi. And we had over uh, 1,800 attendees and a number of those engaged in the question and answer session. And it was very intriguing uh, to listen to the discussion between um, this author and uh, particularly students at UMKC. And they are planning a second racial equity lecture in the coming months uh, using the funds from the grant. Now, Kansas City, Missouri Public Library also held a virtual uh, Black History program this month on the 21st about a K, uh, KC civil rights leader and politician who was murdered in 1970 
and they will also be creating uh, lesson plans, exploring themes such as racial and social injustice and structural racism. And they're gonna publish those on a new website that they developed. It's already up called caseyblackhistory.org. Um, the Franklin County Historical Society used the grant funds. Uh, they will be holding um, a virtual community panel next month or so. Um, including uh, city of Ottawa uh, officials, community members, uh, folks that were impacted by segregation in general uh, in Ottawa, but particularly those that were um, uh, subject to segregation in their community swimming pool to talk about past uh, segregation and, um, and uh, get through the healing process. They will also be um, producing a traveling exhibit on segregation history and um, the future of that swimming pool. And that traveling exhibit will be, uh, become an online exhibit and they're gonna add uh, additional interviews with community members who lived through both the segregation and de desegregation of that swimming pool. Um, the Johnson County uh, Parks and Recreation, um, they're partnering with the Johnson County Museum to develop a three week virtual field trip for high school uh, juniors in the Kansas City area that starts next month. In the first week, um, they uh, uh, students will explore the topics of redlining and the history of uh, real estate segregation. And week two, um, they will have read uh, the play A Raisin in the Sun and will explore scenes that um, were considered too controversial to include in the 1960s Broadway production and why that was so. And then week three, um, they will create their own mixed media art piece, synthesizing all the elements and themes that they have discussed in the previous two weeks and will use for inspiration uh, two artists, African-American artists, one that was known for his depictions of the 1960s civil rights era and another one who's a postmodern uh, artist. Um, and then the Quindero Underground Railroad Museum, um, they uh, will hold an Emancipation Day of Service Reconciliation uh, and Courageous Conversations on April 16th and 17th. On the first day, they will have a community roundtable discussion um, uh, to discuss equity and justice and the goal of developing solutions to crime and equity and racism. And on uh, the second day, they'll have a day of giving back and service. And the first part of that will be creation of a community mural that will be in the Quindaro Underground Railroad Museum. And it will reflect themes of healing and empathy and diversity and change. And that same day, they will also restore and add signage to a community garden uh, that is, uh, and also upgrade and enhance the pathways at the Quindrero uh, Underground Railroad uh, Township ruins um, so that citizens will have a place to travel and reflect on how far we've come in terms of race relations and can envision a society of peace and healing and unity. Now, Jackson County Historical Society is using its grant uh, to produce uh, in partnership with uh, the uh, radio station KOJH, uh, the American Jazz Museum, the Black Archives of Mid-America and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, who are all partners of Freedom's Frontier uh, to produce 22 weekly radio shows um, in the first six months of 2021. And they will uh, uh, include different historic and cultural aspects from the black community of Jackson County which is uh, uh, a county uh, that, that includes Kansas City, Missouri. And they will include appearances by civic and city leaders and um, engage listeners uh, who will call in and hopefully ask questions and there'll be a, a great interaction. The Mahaffey uh, Stagecoach Stop and Farm Historic Site, which is listed as, is located on the Kansas side, they will uh, hire high school teachers that will research and gather resources on race during the reconstruction in Eastern Kansas and will particularly uh, concentrate on George Washington Carver, scientist, inventor, and former Missouri slave who also lived in Kansas and unfortunately witnessed uh, a racially motivated lynching uh, in Kansas. 
And Pat Singleton, who was an activist and former slave who was known basically as the father of the exodus into Kansas, uh, uh, those uh, former slaves who came into Kansas are called exodusters. And the teachers will then create lesson plans for use in secondary level classrooms um, based on asking and answering questions to stimulate critical thinking and to draw out ideas and underlying presuppositions. Uh, uh, this will be available to all teachers, but they will to Kansas, uh, Eastern Kansas and Western Missouri teachers. There are other initiatives that uh, Freedom's Frontier has taken too, and um, want to take some time to talk about those, the last of which um, uh, Mr. Glenn will uh, talk about. Um, first of all, um, in September of 2020, um, 21 sites in Kansas that are part of the National Parks Freedom um, Network to Freedom uh, commemorated the International Underground Railroad Month uh, with uh, digital programming events. There were at least 11 of those presentations. You can find them on our YouTube site that includes the movie Dawn of Day, uh, the Battle of Island Mound uh, State Historical Site, uh, which is the uh, battle site of the first uh, Kansas Colored Infantry Regiment, the first colored regiment in the United States. Uh, the African American Quilt Museum, um, the Western Route of the Underground Railroad, and um, that was uh, also included proclamations for, from both the Kansas and Missouri governors, Governor uh, Kelly and Governor Parsons. Um, there was also, um, we've partnered with the Equal Justice uh, Initiative as a part of a community re uh, remembrance project to have steel monuments erected and soil collected to memorialize documented victims of racial violence, such as uh, lynching victims and foster meaningful dialogue about race and justice. Um, those victims are also commemorated in the Equal Justice Initiative's Memorial for Peace and Justice in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. One of those sites we're working directly with is in Douglas County where three African-American males were taken from a jail and, and hung and uh, uh, they will be part of that community remembrance. Um, the Stopping Stones, uh, the Freedom Frontier National Heritage Area is also partnering with the Stopping Stones Project, which is a remembrance program designed to memorialize on small bro uh, bronze markers, the names of enslaved persons and have them erected in the places where they were once enslaved. Uh, and by remembering those enslaved people, we can keep them from being lost to history and take a step towards reconciliation. Um, the next um, initiative, I will defer to uh, Mr. Glenn to talk about the 21 day racial equity habit building challenge. Okay, thank you. I, I want to say that the board was very much interested in what can we do individually uh, to um, make ourselves more aware and more involved. And we did two primary things. One is that through this grant process that Holly has explained, we asked the board members to participate in the review of those grants and also have encouraged uh, the, the board members to attend Zoom meetings and the like when final products are, in, um, are um, presented so that there is some uh, direct sense of this is what we did and why we did it. And secondly, we, uh, um, Holly's sister, who is on the board, Kristen, um, suggested from a friend something about the 21-day reading list that we'll show you in a minute, but basically you're, the idea is that you read 21 different readings over 21 days to become more aware of racial justice issues. And we modified it slightly because we decided that we would take a topic a week and meet for an hour to discuss. And we would make it a voluntary thing among our board members uh, keeping in mind that it is primarily the white members that need to do the work, that the minority members uh, are living it and do not need to be immersed in it unless they choose to. We were fortunate to have about half the board participate at one time or another, and uh, we were also fortunate to have several 
more minority members of the board participate and provide us perspectives. I felt that every week I learned more of what I did not know. And it was one of the most gratifying experiences that I participated in. And when we completed that, we decided to continue that at least for a while with a reading a book a month. So we moved from weekly meetings to monthly meetings, uh, have one tonight. Um, and uh, those, those books have been interesting. And uh, we, we have had some thought leaders that have helped with the books. But all in all, that gets the board involved in the process. And there is a great hunger uh, by uh, many of the board members to know more uh, because uh, many of us grew up in the 60s and thought that the world had changed a lot since then. And in many ways it has, and in many ways it has not. And the fact that it has not, and the whole concept of white privilege was lost on so many of us. And um, it's just been a broadening experience. And I expect the board will continue this emphasis because it really does fit with the theme of enduring struggle for freedom, that those freedoms are not easily won and they are easily lost and they continue to today. Uh, so that's that's a little bit of perspective about that. I, I do want to put a plug in. Our, our Rotary Club was announcing today the 21 day reading because the YWCA's across America, many of them are sponsoring uh, reading the same list, the 21 day list through the month of March. So if you're not particip participating, then you might look up at your local YWCA and have an opportunity to participate locally in, in discussions. And I think the discussions add so much more to the reading. Uh, Jim? Thank you, Grant. And thank you, Holly and Johnny for putting this together. Uh, we'll be available after um, the other presentations to answer questions as well. So back to you, Sarah. Awesome, thanks y'all. Um, those are some incredible projects. I can't wait to see um, how they all turn out. Um, so thank you so much for sharing and really impressed with your board involvement as well. So kudos. All right, so next up we have Mary Kate Williams and Kent Bain from Mississippi Hills National Heritage Area. Um, they're gonna share a little bit about um, the African-American heritage within their National Heritage Area and also talk about a couple of grant projects as well. And so I don't know, do y'all need to share your screen, Mary Kate? We don't, we were just gonna talk if that's okay with y'all. That's totally fine. Okay, um, my name is Mary Kate. I'm with the Mississippi Hills National Heritage Area. Um, Kent is also in here. Kent's our program coordinator and Kent has actually been with the Hills since they were, um, since it started. And so we were just going to go over a little bit of the African-American history in our area. And then I was going to let him talk to that. And then the different, um, partners we have and the relevant projects to this. Kent? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's good to be with you. Um, we have a, a really rich uh, African American heritage in the Mississippi Hills. That's uh, that subject is one of our uh, four primary interpretive themes, but that's a bit misleading mis uh, because uh, so much of our history and our other themes are focused on African American heritage and, and deal with that in a very substantial way. Uh, music and literature, and of course the, the Civil War. Those are two other interpretive themes that. Uh, just are, are um, really uh, saturated with uh, African American heritage and and uh, looks like we lost Kent. Let's see if he'll get back in. Can I see you're there? Do, can you hear us? check on him okay i'll kind of pick up okay 
where he left off until he can get back on. But um, what he was saying is that with our four interpretive themes, it is kind of misleading because all of them do kind of, well, they all go back to African-American heritage. We've had, um, I guess this is our fifth year of our grant round. Um, we've been able to award, I think close to a million dollars in grants for area projects. Um, some of those, let me see, I'm sorry, I've got my notes. Um, let me pull this up, I'm sorry. My computer's not cooperating. Hold on, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm pulling up everything. I made a list. What we did, we were going to focus on is some of our partnerships through the years. We we're very lucky. We cover 30 counties in the hills, and we have wonderful partners. Some of those are Russ College, which is um, an historic, historically black learning institution, and we've done a lot with the Ida B. Wells Museum in Holly Springs. They do a racial justice weekend. I guess last year was the first weekend at they did it and I don't have the numbers, but it was a huge success. So we're following up with that again this year. Um, hold on, I'm sorry. Something that and we're part of, we have several universities in our area. One of them is the University of Mississippi, which obviously has a, um, a lot of history to it. And something we've done with them, it was two years ago is through Roanoke. Um, they did, which is William Faulkner's home, they did um, a slavery research group project, which was kind of a background. It was something the university wanted to be a part of, but it was a um, focus on the slaves that had worked at Roanoke, which is something that had never been really explored before. That was really interesting. Um, another one that's kind of continued, that's one of, my favorite projects that we sponsor, it's, um, it's through Russ College. Um, it's behind the big house. And, you know, I guess in Mississippi, we still have the pilgrimage tours where people tour the old antebellum homes. And um, the slave quarters, and it always, it always had been on the homes, but not the, um, behind the big house is where the slaves lived and worked. And so, They've done live reenactments of, you know, cooking, building the bricks. It's really, really neat. That's kind of been a big draw. So that's something else. Um, Contraband Camp in Corinth. We've helped them produce videos. Um, I'm trying to think. Let me. Kent, do you have anything you need to add? I know you have more of the notes in front of you. I can't see. So Mary Kate's what we can do is if, um, if we will, we can move over to Motor Cities and then if you guys can get back online, we can come kind of circle back to you guys, if that sounds good. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry, great. he's in the office. I'm, I'm in my car and I don't have everything in front of me because I have <laughs> okay. another appointment. So I'm so sorry, let me figure out what happened and I do apologize. No worries, no worries. We'll, we'll go ahead and we'll circle back to you, okay? Thank you. Yeah, all right. So thanks y'all, Mississippi Hills. Hopefully we'll get to hear a little bit more. Um, but we're gonna move over to Motor Cities National Heritage Area. We've got Brian Yop, is that right, Brian? It is, yes. Okay, excellent. And then Bob Sadler are gonna talk about two different programs. 
and just let me know if this is wrong. So they're going to discuss um, an existing program and then how it's sort of changing. And then they're going to talk about a new program, a new diversity initiative program that Motor Cities is doing. So I'll let you guys take it away. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to go ahead and actually kick it over to Bob Sadler, who's our communications uh, manager. So he's the man you came to see. And then I'll, I'll close up uh, when, when Bob finishes. So take it away, Bob. Okay. I am just looking for my, my right screen to share. There we go. All right, I'm gonna start with, uh, I can't see where I'm looking here. Okay, can we all see that? Yes. Okay, so we, we have traditionally always done, you know, some observation of Black History Month uh, using our owned and shared media and one new wrinkle that we were able to add this year, um, because we are in the process of rebuilding our makingtracks.org website, which details the story of African-Americans in the auto industry. Um, and the first phase of that covers the auto migration triggered by Henry Ford's $5 day in 1914 and runs through about 1950. And that website was created about 10 years ago and is in the process of being rebuilt because of the, the fact that Google is no longer supporting um, the platform on which it was built. So one of the things I was able, I, I, I took all the videos on the old website and moved them over to our YouTube page and have used that as a significant basis for our social media posts for the month of February and have mixed that along with some other aspects of our owned media, namely our story of the week, which is kind of the major franchise of our website and also forms uh, the basis for our weekly e-newsletter. And so show some of the, uh, the social posts you can see Today actually is the 15th of 16 of these videos that uh, is going up on our, on our social. This was just posted not too long ago. And so we've been mixing our normal, our normal posts about our stories of the week, our this day in auto heritage, and also including pretty much daily during the weekdays, the additional posts of the African-American history video series that we have through our Making Tracks website. And uh, those have, have really boosted our awareness of African-Americans in the auto industry, has also boosted uh, visitation to our YouTube page, which is something that um, just in the last year with some of the new programming we've been doing, we've really intensified our efforts in terms of uh, using video, both in social media and uh, reinvigorating our YouTube presence. So we also, um, it's formed the basis for uh, a good portion of our, our Black History Month programming from our owned and, and shared media standpoint. There's an additional piece and a lot of this reinvigoration has been brought upon by um, a new committee of our board that's been in existence uh, since the beginning of 2020, which was a diversity, equity, and inclusion subcommittee of our board. And one of the ideas that came out of that was a new website or a new page on our website, that being uh, a page called Many Voices, One Story. And this is an under construction page of our site that essentially is been built to share stories of how our region put the world on wheels, but emphasizing diverse and inclusive range of peoples 
and with a wide variety of backgrounds, languages, and cultures. And so the Making Tracks initiative is there. Uh, something else that we completed in 2020, the Southwest Detroit Auto Heritage Guide is something that is there. And we're going to populate this page uh, with an increasing number of new initiatives of our, from our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, priorities. And one thing that's actually going to go up on this page and on our social to close out Black History Month is an interview that was done with Rory Gamble, who is the new president of the United Auto Workers. He is the first African-American president of the UAW. And we were able to do through the, uh, the work of our board member uh, from the UAW, we were able to submit questions and have him answer them. So we're going to put an article up on this page and on our social talking about his experiences as being a uh, trailblazer in the, in the labor movement. And this uh, Many Voices, One Story, like I said, is going to be a living document. It will continue to uh, be updated with new initiatives as we go along. And I think that segues well into Brian's uh, new pieces that he's speaking of. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Bob. And, and yeah, I appreciate that. Like you said, the segue that sort of sets all this up because that background and the making tracks in particular uh, is always a great project to highlight. So it's very timely that we were able to talk about it again this year, even though the site itself is under construction, we're able to reuse those and repurpose the pieces that we have to continue to tell that story. Uh, I, I contend that Motor Cities, uh, though we talk about the automobile and, and, and labor's uh, impact on the United States and the world, is really and always has been a story about people. You know, it's about the contributions of people and the roles that they played over all of these years and the way that's evolved. Uh, so in a way this, you know, a month like this month, like History Month, is a story about me and, and some of you. It's specific to me is both of my grandfathers sort of represent that great migration story that Bob alluded to, the migration, both of them born in Georgia, both of them moved uh, to Michigan, one to work for Ford, one to work for Chrysler, and they created the middle class uh, lives for our family that we still enjoy today. And so I can appreciate it from that perspective. Uh, so I'm so glad to see at least some representation of their stories, not specifically their names, but they, you know, they're, they're encompassed in the stories that we're telling. Uh, and that's really what this whole next step of our, our, our work is about, is telling more stories and what we're all really challenged for. So all of us as heritage areas uh, have a little piece of America's story uh, and we all are challenged to sort of how to interpret it. Uh, as Bob mentioned, our board took a real hard look at all of this at the end of 2019 and formed a committee uh, in 2020 for diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, that we eventually have adopted a value statement that now permeates across all levels of organization. So it's not just in programming and outward facing, we're talking about on our board level and our staff uh, internal level. Uh, and in reality, these values have just become part of our daily lives. Just like you, you wake up in the morning, you put on a pair of socks, you, you know, these, this is part of our regular operation and what becomes part of our regular thinking. Uh, so as the committee develops strategies, we set out to make better connections to the partners and the people that we know we're missing from the story. So we appreciate our, our typical and traditional partners. And I like what Freedom Frontier was bringing up in that you don't know what you don't know, that you can, you can kind of live in a malaise for a long time and not realize that there's so much more out there uh, to be gleaned from these folks that you're not even at the table. And this was illustrated by uh, us inviting someone to take a look at our website. And their immediate observation back to us was when they logged in, they were turned off and logged off because they didn't see themselves represented in that site. And representation is such an important piece of, of what we're talking about because you could have all the great stories that you want to, but if they don't relate to the people you're trying to tell your stories to and tell the stories about, uh, then they really don't end up having the value that you want them to. And I'll leave it to your imagination, honestly, of who, what group or what individuals, you know, who was sort of represented by that. But for them to look at our site and say, well, I don't see myself in that, you know, really hit home because that's obviously not our intention. You know, our intention is to try to tell as broad of a story uh, as we can uh, across our, our, our footprint because there's so many different people that contributed particularly specifically to the auto industry because it's such a melting pot of America's history. Uh, and so we set out to uh, take it on and, and it starts with uh, some activity. It starts with being humble about the fact that you don't know what you don't know, but you realize that there are missing pieces. Uh, and so it may be a phone call, it may be an email, it may be a, a, a connection uh, 
you know, through an existing partnership or through an existing relationship, and maybe a LinkedIn note, you, you know, maybe a cold start and you might get a cold shoulder. But the reality is that we hope that the results of us reaching out to uh, diverse partners, others that represent other cultures and other uh, elements of our story leads to more engagement in products like Story of the Week that educate our viewers every week or our speakers bureau, or our grant program, uh, our stewardship communities who meet and talk about projects that they could be working on and even our board, of course. Uh, I'm reminded as we're with all the national heritage areas that uh, your colleague Lowell Perry from uh, Yuma's Crossing who heads up the Alliance of National Heritage Areas Diversity um, Committee, you know, always brings up and says, by virtue of being inclusive, you will be diverse. And, and that's, I think, something that we're, we're learning to appreciate what we're doing here. So as Bob said, the initiative title, Many Voices, One Story, is that outward-facing affirmation that you see on the website, but it's also an internal uh, sort of uh, set of values that permeate the whole organization. Uh, I will say that as, as far as new programming goes, we've now included additional prompts in our grant application. So again, I appreciate what Freedom's Frontier was sharing and that being very intentional about reaching out to folks and letting them know that we're here for you and we want to tell more of your story uh, by adding uh, prompts and even incentives to our grant program that those who are breaking down barriers and telling more diverse uh, stories uh, will receive additional um, sort of favor in that grant review process. And then we're excited to say that the, pro the program that Bob has mentioned, Making Tracks, uh, which chronicled the African-American story in the auto industry, essentially from the late 1800s to the 1950, at, will now be brought forward to the second half of the 20th century and beyond, obviously, here we are in 2021, to try to tell even more modern uh, stories about those who have endeavored and, and continued on with themes of courage and entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, all in the face of adversity that we can even better understand today than we did then. And so stories like what we're going to hear from Rory Gamble becoming the first African-American president of the UAW after an organization that existed for 80 plus years is, is a story that we want to hear, but it's not a story that was often told. And we've got some interviews lined up with some great uh, current and former leaders on the auto industry that we'll be excited to post uh, later on. So I'll, I'll sort of end our section of this by saying that there are some exciting things that we're doing at Motor Cities and we, you know, we, we will continue in this mode, but really it's a challenge to all of us, all of us heritage areas because again, we're tasked to tell America's story and it's so rich with contributions from all people. You know, diversity is not just about race. Even though this particular call and this month we're talking about black history, when the calendar turns and we're in the next month and down the road where it's Women's History Month, it's Hispanic Heritage Month, it's Jewish American History Month, it's not black and white, it's about all of our roles collectively and all of us have a little bit of that story to tell. And so I'm, I'm encouraging and even challenging all of us as partners to think about what we could be doing more actively within our organizations to mine out those stories and get more of that uh, to the forefront because you know, there's more to be told. Thank you so much, Motor Cities. Appreciate y'all um, sharing the information. I'm curious, I have a question about how, what was the process of crafting that value statement? Is that something that y'all did internally? Did you have someone help you with that? Um, I know those things can be kind of arduous sometimes. So just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, you are correct that it was arduous. You are correct. But at the same time, it was it was an internal effort. Our, our diversity team was, was people who were willing to work on this cause. And uh, we we meet every month. Uh, I think I heard uh, Freedom Frontier say they started out meeting weekly on some projects. But we meet every month. And that was one of the immediate goals was to craft a value statement that goes right along with our mission and our vision that there's a value statement that speaks to this. And so it really governs now as things move forward to say, if you truly value this, and this is how it's going to come up and all these other elements. So you know, there was some wordsmithing that went on. There were a few drafts of it, uh, but ultimately the committee drafted something that uh, when it was presented to the board, they accepted it with you know unanimous vote. There was no issue with the rest of the board accepting it and understanding its importance. So it was, you know, it was an internal committee thing. We didn't go as far as you know, hiring in to say a consultant or someone to you know really over oversee it, but so it came from that group. Well, thank you. All right. Well, that concludes the sort of formal presentation part of the call. Um, Mississippi Hills was not, or Kent was not able to get back online, but Mary Kate's is here to answer any questions that you might have. So um, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions for our presenters, and you can do that in two ways. You can just unmute uh, yourself and call it out, or you can type it in the chat and we can read it for you. Everyone, this is Mary Kate. I just wanted to apologize. I'm in the car. I don't have anything in front of me. 
I'm embarrassed, I don't have it. Um, Kent is having technical issues, but I'm happy to answer questions and we're gonna send a follow-up presentation just so y'all can see all the different things that we've done, but I do apologize. It's not going my way today. <laughs> and we'll make sure that that presentation ends up in, the, in an email too for everybody on the list. Thank you. Well, I had a question, um, honestly, a curiosity, I guess, as we wrap up Black History Month, and I know there were three of us uh, designated and sort of presenting here today, but I'm curious to hear other maybe briefer stories about some things that other heritage areas are, are doing, have done. What, what strikes me is that when the Alliance of Heritage Areas met here in Detroit a uh, year before last, there was a whole diversity session that we hosted, and I remember uh, a few of the, you know, the folks sort of a noodling over this idea of how diversity works with their heritage area because of the story that they tell. I mean, ours and automotive heritage, we we have the gift and the curse of telling a living story that is always evolving. So there's always something that's sort of being added to it versus some people felt like, you know, whether we represent a natural resource or, you know, a historic battle or something like that, that, you know, our story's got a period at the end and we can't really cross too many lines with how that gets sold. So I'm curious as to, uh, do people find ways that they can integrate, you know, Black History Month or other diversity stories into their existing programming, you know, that maybe weren't apparent to them before. No, okay, well then the problem is solved, man. Everybody's operating at a thousand percent capacity on, on African-American and- This is this is Logan, I'm with the Appalachian Forest National Heritage Area. Um, we, uh, we're just now going through our management planning process. And part of that, we have, we have, I guess, worked diversity uh, into our into our uh, service or our, our interpretation, mostly through in the last year or so through our uh, rotating rotating uh, exhibit at our museum, where we talked about um, uh, the uh, source of of immigration into Western Virginia and West Virginia, uh, so forth uh, or so far. And we, I think we try to touch on, on all the important or the most, what we felt we could get in done, get done in, in a single uh, display. Uh, but since we're on the subject, my, my question is, uh, what are the critical components of the organizational documents that we're, we're recreating right now from, from the ground up that should address these issues uh, and, and pay Pay, uh, pay special attention to diversity and inclusiveness uh, in our primary documents. I mean, would it be in the, uh, uh, well, actually just, where, where, where should it mostly fall into our primary documents? Wow, that's, yeah, that, that's a, uh, a super loaded question. I know uh, Liz, Liz V. Myers on the call too, because that's sort of, when you talk about the, the hierarchy or so the, the way they do detail the documents that maybe there may be a formal answer to that but i'll tell you from motor cities it was there was reference to it in our in our management plan but though i mean the management plan is several several hundred pages so you, as right. you know uh, so it can it can pop up there but there are references to it in there but it wasn't as overt as what we did in the last year so even though we've been around since 98 so we're 22 years old 23 years old that we had to take us, you know, set aside and create this value statement sort of out of thin air because it wasn't explicitly stated as it wouldn't have been, you know, in 1998. So I think as, as the world has evolved and become more aware of all of this, that it, it, you have an opportunity to put it in on the ground floor rules. We had to add it uh, later on. But there are references to telling a broad story of, of working people, for instance, in our management thing. But that was specific to us because we also interpret you know, the automobile industry, and we also interpret the labor industry. So in the inherent in that is sort of the story of the people. But, you know, other heritage areas may not have had that written in because it was in our legislation. So we had to include it in our management plan and we addressed it, but other heritage areas might not have that. So that I can only give you our perspective is that it was, it was um, there, but we had to add it in the most recent effort that we just did that we're, you know, now undertaking as a regular part of our, our, our overall organizational values. Hi, uh, Brian, Logan. I just wanted to kind of follow up on the conversation a little bit. This is Allie from the Niagara Falls National Heritage Area. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. 
Um, I just wanted to uh, just kind of jump in a little bit. Uh, so how we uh, started really approaching all of our programs and projects and the work that we do uh, really stemmed from our um, involvement and the design and, and building of the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center that exists in our uh, National Heritage Area. Uh, we have a unique shared staffing plan uh, with that organization. Uh, so we're still currently operating uh, the Heritage Center that opened in 2018. Um, but what we kind of really learned throughout that process is as we design the exhibits, we really, um, we move the perspectives, stories, voices, visual imagery of black individuals on the Underground Railroad and, and through that, that lens to the forefront of everything we were doing. So kind of what we learned from that is, is that every time we approach a program, a project or something like that, we're always asking ourselves whose perspective is this you know is this coming from uh, is that the right one always engaging community members um, in uh, in the process in some way or another to make sure that that we're always always moving diversity and inclusion at the forefront no matter how no matter how small or big our projects are um, and, and I'll also add to um, we we started a public art uh, program uh, that's right outside of the Underground Railroad Heritage Center. And we had heard from our community members there that they really wanted to see their local history highlighted. Um, so we made that a priority. And um, most of the murals, uh, there's, I think there's a, close to 14 now, um, focus on the black history within the community um, right there next to the Heritage Center, including a new Black Lives Matter mural as well. So uh, kind of giving you a couple different examples, but I guess the way we've kind of just looked at it, whether we're writing language into a document or we're having a conversation with somebody or we're designing a new program we're always uh considering okay you know again whose perspective is that is this uh who's involved in it who isn't involved in it do we need to change that and always making sure that's at the forefront of our conversations and our planning process Thank you, Allie. Linda, you have your hand raised, I see. Yeah, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. Yep. I just wanted to, I had a thought about the question from Logan and where in your document, especially if you're doing a new one, to, to make space for these, these kinds of various uh, stories. And the first thing that came to mind for me was the themes, because they can be uh, they can be broad, but they they ideally include uh, these universal concepts, which can include, which may very well include, uh, you know, life, death, but also uh, diversity and equality and struggle and uh, these kinds of concepts that that everyone can relate to from their own experience, but may need some. Uh, emotional and intellectual connection help to help with that uh, from from organizations like yours that that can bring these stories and open people's eyes. So, a, a, a relook at your themes if you're an old area to see what might you might mind there, uh, and and a and uh, a, uh, a a tickle or a reminder if you're if you're writing them now to to make sure that people can connect to these diversity stories in your new themes would, um, would be a suggestion. Uh, yeah, thank you, Linda. That, that's, we're actually just getting ready to send out our new, new uh, draft themes uh, to our work groups. So this was a very good timing on that. I'll, I'll make sure that our planning consultants uh, include this, this, these issues into, into all of our discussions moving forward. And I think we have been, it just hasn't been as, you know, up in your face uh, as it intentional. As it probably should yeah. be intentional. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. One more thing, one more thing I could add just as a, you know, it, it Certainly diversity is much more than, uh, you know, just the African-American story. One thing that came out of our, our diversity, equity and inclusion committee uh, and something that I put together was a planning calendar for our social media, our own media. And I did some research and I literally put all of the different possible groups into a monthly calendar. And so, you know, obviously we've got Black History Month in February, but 
you know, and Women's History Month is also pretty common for March, but there's a whole lot of other, you know, ethnicities and, uh, you know, cultural groupings that, that take place that have their own Heritage Month celebrations over the course of a 12 month calendar. So, you know, we're going to make an effort to try to pay attention to these over the course of the year as much as we can within telling our automotive and labor heritage story. So, you know, I'm certainly willing to forward this Excel sheet with these uh, month by month uh, groups um, if anyone's interested in that. Yes, there's, all, there's already been a request from my colleague, Zach, and I was gonna ask for him because I know he would really want that. So thanks, Bob. Yeah, I can, I'll email it to you. Okay. That you and Heather. Good. We can include it on the follow-up email. Um, Linda, thanks for your point about thinking about these stories in terms of the themes and the sort of universals that we think about. Um, I assume that you're an interpreter or have an interpretation background. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to kind of echo that thinking because I think, I mean, I think a lot of times we feel like we want to put these stories in a month or in their own little category, which is not really necessarily where they belong. Like they're a part of all of the story, the entire story. So I think it's a good way to think about that in terms of universals and how can we connect to the universal idea of struggle or loss coming from all of these different perspectives and lived experiences. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, that's important to remember. All right, we've got one minute left. Is there, other, is there anyone else that has a question or wants to share um, anything before we, we close it out? I'm gonna have Heather pop in and kind of just give you guys a preview of next month's call. If we have nothing else, I know that this conversation isn't finished. Um, I know that um, there's a lot of work happening around these ideas and how NHAs implement this um, through the N, the A N H A. Um, so maybe that will be coming coming through too as well. So, Heather, do you want to share about March's call? Is that right? Next month is yes, March. Yes, <laughs> it's. Well, I think so. In fact, it's a month from today, so it's March 25th, same time. Um, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to be talking about, we're talking with national heritage areas that have rental programs specifically related to recreation. So that could be kayaks or boats or bicycles. Um, so if you'd really like to have a great program going in your heritage area and you'd like to share, um, please reach out to me and let me know. Um, and if this is something you're thinking about doing, definitely plan to tune in to next month's call. So, so. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for coming. Presenters, thank you so much for sharing the great work that you're doing. Um, we're really, I'm really, like I said, I'm really excited about what, what National Heritage Areas are doing and seeing how we can implement them here at Arabia Mountain. Um, what else was I gonna say? We'll send out uh, the recording and then all of the files and things that would get sent to us um, in a week or so. So um, yep. you guys be safe and thank you so much. Bye.